is dwelling in our hearts. Lord, as we just come before you now, as we worship your holy name, both in this place and at home, those who are watching online, we just pray that your, your spirit will descend upon us, that we may feel that sense of validation through your love and through your son, Jesus. Be with my friends this morning as we just worship your holy name this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our first song we're going to be singing this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. For those of you who have songbooks, those of you watching at home, it is 31 in our songbooks this morning. But as always, the words will be on the screen with the company video. So that is 31 in the songbook. I invite you to stand if you are able as we just sing together. Holy, holy, holy.
If you do have your Bibles, I do really encourage you to look at Psalm 61. It is a refreshing bit of scripture. It is about when our hearts get heavy with burden, that we can stand upon his rock and proclaim him as Lord over all. And you know what, friends? In the world where it's rife with challenge and struggle and pain, and when our hearts begin to bleed through such things, what a comfort it is that the psalmist would compose the 61st psalm and give us that assurance that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity is above all of those things. So what we're going to be doing this morning, I'm going to stop wandering around because I'm going to invite Adrian to the piano now. As Adrian comes to the piano, I'm going to ask him to write us, right? Excuse me, play a reflective melody as we contemplate the 61st Psalm. And what I encourage you to do this morning, friends, is where the gaps are, I just encourage you to write somebody's name that you're praying for. It can be your very own name. It can be a community. Whatever is on your heart this morning, friends, where you feel your prayers need to be directed, as I said, if it's for friends, for loved ones, for yourself, or for communities that are challenged right now, I just encourage you to write in the gap who it is you are praying for, or what it is you are praying for. And after you've done that, I want you to read this psalm over. As I said, if you do have your Bibles, I highly encourage you to read the 61st psalm as Adrian plays this morning. And after a time of prayerful contemplation and reflection, I will then close in a few closing prayers. But friends, ultimately, this time is very mature in the name of God. However you choose to get. For those watching at home, we will have the benefit of having the 61st Psalm on the board, and we'll zoom that in for you watching at home. But let us worship the Lord together now, friends, through praying the 61st Psalm. Thank you, Adrian.
forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me an inheritance reserved for those who fear your name. Add many years to the life of the King. Make his years span the generations. May he reign under God's protection. May your unfailing love and faithfulness wash over me. Then I will sing your praises to your name forever, as I fulfill my vows each day. And Father God, as we just pray the 61st Psalm in whatever context.
10.30 will be Adrian and Kerry's farewell Sunday. And finally, final announcement for this week, our very own, I have told you this, our very own Margaret and Jerry have completed the transfer into Solskjaer into this call. So they've transferred from, is it Dunstable? I had that right, that's good. So they've transferred from Dunstable Hall, so they are officially, well, touch with officially soldiers of Wisconsin Speech Salvation Army. So I'm actually going to invite Margaret to come and collect these efforts. <laughs> For those who are unfamiliar with the Salvation Army um, protocol, those who are members are the soldiers, what we wear here. So it is a declaration of our faith. So whether Margaret wants to collect them now or at the end of the meeting, I wish to just offer our congratulations to you, Margaret and Jerry. Welcome to the club, as they say. Adrian's forced to peer pressure, friends. You're very welcome. I didn't actually need you to be dragged up here, but bless you. I must confess, friends, to those who saw that on camera, I did offer it to be at the end of the meeting. Okay, so you want to blame me or blame our Adrian? That's our announcements for this week, and now I'm going to hand over to Paul as he plays the melody for the offering. So for those who want to give it our offering, the same as always, question plates on the table. For those who want to give it at the end of the meeting, you have that offer also, unless Adrian drags you up to give it the offering as well. Um, after which, Paul will then bring us our Bible reading. Thank you, Paul. Jesus went up to the mountainside and called to, to him those he wanted, and they came, came to him. He appointed twelve designated, designated him apostles, and they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have the authority to drive out demons. They are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name von Jairus, where which means the son of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Theodius, Simon, the Zealot. Amen. Thank you, Paul. I neglected to give Paul a copy of the NLC, so forgive me for that, Paul. But NLT and I are very, very similar in nature, so uh, yes. Before we um, go into exploring why I chose this passage, I've got an illustration, and it is immeasurably more. Now, whenever I think about the concept of immeasurably more, I think of how immeasurably more God does for us, and actually, more importantly, how much he surprises us. 
And I have an illustration here, actually. Now, I'm hoping I can have a couple of volunteers who can help me with this. So I'm going to invite Poppy and Christina to help you with something here today. I've noticed that every illustration I've had has involved a table, so... Yeah, so let's continue that theme. Thank you, Poppy and Christina, for helping us with our illustration today. Now then, what we have on the table here today is a glass of water. Now, Poppy, does that glass look pretty full? Yes, it does. I don't have a bigger glass to show you, I'm afraid that's on camera, but for those who can't see properly, for those watching online, it is pretty full. Do you think, Poppy and Christina, we can fit much in that glass? No. Right, okay, well, we have a challenge today. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be putting some items in that glass for me and making sure it doesn't spill. If you spill, well then, we'll have to have a few conversations, won't we? <laughs> right, what we have here is cotton balls. Right, so, I'll give you a prize for the correct answer. How many cotton balls do you think you can fit in there about us filling? Five. How much do you reckon, Christina? Oh, no. <laughs> Ten. Ten. Right, okay. Well then, one at a time then, ladies. Would you like to put some cotton balls into this glass of water? And remember, you cannot spill it. <clears throat> okay, that's one. That's two. Still no spills. Three, four. All right, five. Six. Seven. Eight, oh, eight, nine, ten. Doesn't look like it's changed in that, ladies. I'm afraid it's still full. We fit more in there. Twelve. Oh my goodness, it still hasn't spilled. <laughs> I think we've reached our limit on the glass, haven't we, ladies? Well, how much did you guess? You guessed five, didn't you? And you guessed ten. Ladies, I'm afraid to say, you got the wrong answers. But, what this illustration teaches us is, we were surprised, well I was surprised when I first did this experiment, how much you can fit into a glass of water without it spilling, without it being to the brim. That is a lesson we're just going to unpack very shortly. Let's first have a volunteer, let's volunteer. Let's have a clap for our volunteers. If anything, the water's gone down a little. How about that? What a miracle that is, right? Because <laughs> Jesus operates by a miracle of glass of water and cotton balls. Now, Ephesians 3.20 says that he can do immeasurably more, more than we can ever dream. And I want you to implant that in your minds this morning, friends. I want you to envision about the things that appear impossible, appear beyond our comprehension, and think to yourself, yes, Scripture declares that he is immeasurably more, and he can do immeasurably more, more than we might otherwise expect. For those who are really new to this experiment, and apologies if that's not been new to you, I was fascinated. I thought to myself, hang on a minute, you put something in the glass, it's going to spill. Clearly not. God can surprise us in the exact same way. And our next song to help enforce this point of him being immeasurably more able to do all that we can ever dream is we're going to sing He is Able. And that song is 836 in the songbook. For those watching online, we have your songbooks as well. 836 in the Salvation Army songbook. But as always, we'll have an accompanying video. But friends, he can do immeasurably more. He is able to do immeasurably more in all of our daily lives. So as we sing this next song, let that message just plant in your hearts and minds just now. Feel free to sit or to stand as we sing this next song together. Thank you. 
he is able, more than able, to accomplish more than come to my mind. I forgot to turn my mic off as I sang with friends, so I do apologise if I was a tango bearing her out of tune in many places. I trust that I wasn't, well, I tell myself that. But he is able. Our worth in Jesus, friends. Because in his eyes, you are a somebody. A few of you may have thought that the reading today may have been a tad unorthodox in its nature. Because the second half of it, all it was was listing a few names. I was always taught at Bible College that there's some complicated names to pronounce you delegates. So thank you, Paul. And I must thank Adrian for doing that in the past for me as well. It's a handy and a trick, and Adrian, I encourage you to do so when you move to Chatteris. But there's a reason why I chose that reading when I'm thinking about our worth in Christ. I want to talk to you today about a guy. A guy that is a part of those 12 apostles. And actually, he is a guy, a part of a group that is even more famous than the Beatles. He has performed wonders and miracles. He has served the Lord Jesus on his behalf. He had done great things to change the lives of his people. But it's somebody, I must confess, friends, I don't know. A terrible man about. And I'll be impressed if all of you know more about it as well. But this guy's name is Thaddeus. And he is one of the twelve disciples listed in that group. Now we have all heard of Simon Peter, we've all heard of Matthew, we've all heard of John, but I want to ask all of you a question today. Have you heard of Thaddeus? I will legitimately oh Adrian has. I would legitimately give a bonus prize for you can tell me anything about Thaddeus. You know what that's answer, Adrian. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, he is. He is. Well, I'll be cheating, but yes, Thaddeus. He's not as well known as Simon Peter or the likes of the other apostles. We've all heard about preaching in the letters. But friends, let me ask you another question. Just because we haven't heard of him, does that make him unsuccessful? No. Exactly right. Does that make him any less worthy to be called a disciple of Jesus? It doesn't. Just because he isn't as well known as the others, it does not make him any less valuable to Jesus. And that is a question we ask ourselves today. In the context of, let's take a salvation on you, are we considered unsuccessful just because our numbers aren't as great as other churches, or vice versa? The answer to that is no. What constitutes success in the Lord's eyes is, is if we are faithfully serving and faithfully embracing who we've been made to be. That is what constitutes success. And Thaddeus, he knew this. He knew this. Just because he wasn't as popular or well known, does not mean he was any less successful in Jesus' eyes. He was still chosen, and he still had worth, because he had been called. Colossians 3.23 simply says this, it says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. So already, work willingly at whatever you do, but work for the Lord rather than the people. This is exactly what Thaddeus did, friends. He didn't work for the reputation or the acclamation of the crowd. No, he worked and he served because he loved Jesus. He served the Lord with all of his heart. And as I said, friends, that is what constitutes success. I'm afraid to say, I mean, I could be wrong in this, but from my impression, society today is obsessed with statistical measure of success. Or are we making the most money? Or do we have the most numbers? Or do we have the most infrastructure? That, I'm afraid to tell you folks, that is how society today, in all of this context, measures success. And actually, I dare say that's a talent healthy in places. Because that does not constitute a sense of worth in the hearts of people. And friends, it is not of God. That is not how God measures success. It is as simple as that. So I want today to briefly look at Thaddeus as the ultimate example 
of being somebody totally fulfilled in what he was doing. Somebody who knew in his heart to work willingly for the Lord and to reap the blessing that comes from that. And actually, I have to tell you, that's a lesson I've learned from yourself over these past, well, life's a journey, this isn't friends. And that's why I have to keep telling myself whenever I'm feeling like I'm not feeling worthy of something. The Lord called each and every one of us to serve in the context that each and every one of us has. And you know the beautiful thing, friends? We are all so uniquely and wonderfully made. And we're all so uniquely different. With so many different passions, skills, callings, jobs. And you know what? There's a beauty to that. And the beautiful thing about that, friends, is that we are all called to be in those places. Our paths, our journeys have been carefully crafted by the Lord. And that is where he wants you. That is where he wants us. So Thaddeus was like, you know what? Use me, Lord, for the extent of your kingdom. I want to serve you. I don't want my name in the books. Or I don't want my name in an epistle. I just want to serve you. You know what? That's so refreshing, isn't it? That is refreshing. And I looked at Thaddeus as, well, an ironic example, really. So I'm not very well known, providing the ultimate example of humility and service. There are two very brief things I want to unpack. And firstly, people may not know you, but Jesus does. People may not know you, but Jesus does. And I have to tell you, I mean, I could be wrong in this, but for my own example, it's human nature to desire that recognition. I remember in school, I was very, very insecure. I was very, very insecure in my self-worth. I felt that to feel worthy amongst my peers, I needed to be good at something, or I needed to know something. I was very, very insecure, and actually, that doesn't foster a very prosperous environment in my heart. Between you and I, I thought the key for me being recognised or seeking that affirmation was through hockey or sports. It wasn't. That did not make me feel fulfilled. It made me feel better in my abilities, but whenever I got home, I closed the door behind me, I think, what's different? What I was doing there, I was seeking the affirmation of my peers. I didn't have that sense in my heart of feeling that fulfillment. It wasn't in my heart. But people may not know you, but Jesus does. And in hindsight, since coming to faith, that has been, oh, it speaks for itself. I can't put it into words how meaningful this relationship with Jesus has been. Because he fosters that same sense in our hearts. So, Thaddeus, faithfully served in the background, may not have been known by his peers, but he still faithfully served. Yet, Despite him not being known, I suspect, and you know what, I guarantee he did every single thing that Simon Peter did, that Matthew did, that John and Bartholomew did. I guarantee he did each and every one of those things. And you know why? From what it says later on in the Gospel. Mark 6, verse 7, simply says this. It says, And he called the twelve disciples together, and he began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. So it says right there, Jesus had sent them out two by two. He had anointed each and every one of them to go out and give them that authority. Because they had that calling in their hearts, that sense of purpose, that was the authority they needed. Not only for ministering, ministering to the people, but cultivating that relationship with Jesus. It's all in the heart, friends. But I know Thaddeus was equally valued because it says it right there. All of them got sent out. Not just Simon Peter. Not just Bartholomew. All of them. They were tasked and anointed and they served the Lord. And this is the important thing I want us to grasp today, friends. Thaddeus may not have been Simon Peter. He may not have been John. He may not have written an epistle or penned a gospel. But Jesus didn't want Thaddeus to be Simon Peter. He did not want Thaddeus to be Bartholomew. He did not want him to be John. Who Jesus wanted Thaddeus to be was Thaddeus. 
He wanted that to be done. I'm going to call him that. It's much easier to say. He wanted that to be that. Because that is who he was called to be. He was called to be himself. He was called to embrace his journey. Not Simon Peter's. I sometimes long to wish that I had the skills Adrian has. But he did not call me to be Adrian. Adrian did not call him. No. The Lord did not call Adrian to be Liam. And vice versa. We are called to be ourselves. And you know what? Thaddeus knew this. He knew this in his heart. We should not compare ourselves to others. I can't speak for everybody, but I feel there's a real danger of looking sideways to our peers. Looking sideways to those with other careers, or living in other homes, or whatever the context is. Looking sideways, friends, is a real danger. But I implore you to take a leaf out of that book, to embrace who you've been made to be, to embrace the path God has set up for you, and to say, this is who I want you to be. Yes, it would be nice to play the piano half as well as Adrian, but that is not what the Lord has gifted me with. And you know what? I accept that. I accept that. Jesus wants you to be you. That's all you need to know with this. To be who you were made to be, to serve where you were called to serve, to not look sideways. Jeremiah 1 9 says this, as it is on the board. 1 5, so I said 1 9. 1 5. I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Before you were formed in the mother's womb, I set you apart and I appointed you. This, whatever our journeys have held over our lives, this was from the very beginning. He has carefully crafted our journeys, whether we knew it or not. And it was the same for Thaddeus. And you know what? I'm very, being very biased here. I'm not singing the praises of all 12 apostles, but you know what? There's a lot to be desired for that. So humble. He knew this as well. He, he knew this. And our second and last point is, people may not realise your worth, but Jesus does. You're noticing a theme here, aren't you, friends? Amen to that. Out of the thousands, out of the multitudes, out of all the crowds that gathered during the height of Jesus' popularity, he chose that. Out of all of those people, now I want you to ask yourself, if you're in that position, I want you to imagine that we were at this huge, huge festival, this huge Christian gathering, Jesus appeared and he said, I want you. Surely that's got to mean something. Surely that has got to mean something. That knew that it meant a heck of a lot. It meant a heck of a lot. He felt that cultivation in his heart, where he had placed him them for a reason. He had placed each and every one of us in our jobs, in our lives for a reason. Ephesians 1 4. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. The key word is in the middle God loved us and he chose us. He had chosen us. The King of Kings, the Holy of Holies, the Master of the Universe had chosen you. And that is not only a chore, a place to rejoice and to celebrate, but also it is a solemn reminder that when life gets a bit difficult, whenever I'm feeling not worthy, I remember that, yes, in my heart, Jesus had chosen me, and he had chosen you. And we will all suffer from burnout, we will all get tired, I will, I will testify, we had a conversation last night, didn't we, about getting tired. That one's more coffee related than spiritual related. Or it might be spiritual related, I don't know. But friends, we are all suffering from burnout. We all get tired. I myself am feeling very tired and planning my wedding, which, by the way, is in two weeks. Oh. I mean, hooray, yes. No, no, I say that because it's dream for me, that's all. It's just a lot of plans, you know, if you're watching that, sorry. It's... Uh, 
It takes a while of you. Things in life take a while of you, don't they? It exhausts you. We all suffer from that burnout. We all suffer from that tiredness. But friends, whatever mountains we face, whatever mountains of exhaustion or frustration we face, know that the heavenly rewards of embracing our calling, embracing who we're being to be, and inheriting the kingdom of God is so worth it. Jesus charged his disciples with that. It will be worth it, friends. I'm paraphrasing, of course. I don't know the exact words Jesus said other than what's written in Scripture. But I can imagine him encouraging his troops to go about the world, be who they're meant to be. It is all worth it. It all stems from the heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, which will be in a minute, is... But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the way things you see them. People judge by our appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at each and every one of your hearts. And he looks to who you've been meant to be to the calling upon your lives, to the very lives you need. He looks at the heart, and if we are faithfully embracing who we've been made to be, validating our sense of worth, not by worldly standards, but by Jesus' standards, that's what counts. Admittedly, it's a hard thing to do in the 21st century, but friends, know that it is worth it. It is worth it. That never sought glory, fame or population, as I've said countless times, he merely sought to serve. His heart was for Jesus. And that is where the challenge comes for us today. Do we have that heart for Jesus? Do we have that heart to not look sideways, to look on the path that we tread and to say, Lord God, this is what you have laid before me. These are the people you put in my life, and these are the things I will embrace. It is a challenge, and it is a challenge I encourage each and every one of you to not look sideways, to look at who you've been made to be, and in the process, harness that sense of worth in our hearts. People may not know you, Jesus does. People may not realise your worth, but Jesus does. And that is what is important. The world may say that you are a nobody, but friends, take it from me. To Jesus, you are a somebody. And we must find our worth in Jesus. And not meant to that. To help us think and to reflect over this very daunting prospect of life, and the calling that is in our hearts. We're going to be worshipping through another song. The sound of this song does not have a song book number, but it will be available for us just to worship and bask in as the song plays. But as you experience who you have been called to be, the calling the Lord has placed on your life, I just implore you to reflect on who he has made you to be. The talents, the gifts, the personality, all that makes you you. And as we sing here the call of the kingdom, I want you to harness and encompass this teaching Jesus has, to look to Thaddeus as the example, to not look sideways, and to press forwards and embrace the call of the kingdom that Jesus has for each and every one of us. After this song plays, Adrian will then bring us out our benediction. But as I I said, for those watching online, sadly there is no song for them there. But let this song just wash over you this morning. Hear the call of the King.
just a final prayer. Oh God, we just pray, Lord, as we leave this place, that you would draw close to us, validate our sense of worth in you, and be with my friends as they just go about their ways, both here in Wisbeach and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, it's been a pleasure worshiping with you this morning. For those watching online, thank you for joining us this morning. And before I leave off, I will have a telegram reach my attention. So I'm going to have to carry a read out for you. I've missed an announcement. So, an additional announcement this week is Busy Bees is on the Wednesday this week. And this week it is Woodland Thing, is that right? That's right. Yes. So, for those of you who know parents, encourage them to come along this coming Wednesday. As always, be blessed, be a blessing, and may God bless you.